I think both. I think I learned a lot of basics in school. I think I learned a lot of concepts that I might have figured out eventually, but I wasn't necessarily thinking about then that school kind of forced me to figure out. But I'm always still learning, you know, and then when I'm doing set painting in theater, every set is an entirely different problem and challenge. And every set you're learning new techniques and learning new things. And I love to take those ideas and those techniques and kind of bring them into smaller stuff to put into my own work. Welcome to season five of the Drawing From Experience podcast. Your source of relatable advice for the everyday artist. We want you to pick up your pencils, pick up your paintbrush, pick up your instrument or whatever it is that you create with. Because let's face it, this world is so much better with your art in it. Whether you're an artist looking for more inspiration or an art enthusiast that loves to hear about the creative process, you've come to the right place. My name is Shane Isakowski. And I'm Stefania Medeiros. And this is the Drawing From Experience podcast. Hello, humans. This is Shane Isakowski. And I'm Stefania Medeiros. And this is episode number 126 of the Drawing From Experience podcast. Welcome. Uh, this is the first episode of uh, the new interviews for 2022 with our new co-host, Stefania. So welcome, Stefania. Thank you. I'm so excited. This is also my first interview to date ever. Ever? Ever. ever? Really? I've never interviewed another artist before. Oh, so this wow. is fantastic. Well, this is a crash course. I mean, it's uh, there. there's nothing better than just diving right in, you know, diving head first. So thank you so much for uh, agreeing to do this. So I'm so excited to be here. And I'm so excited to learn about all of these artists as well. I think that I've learned that my favorite part of this is doing that deep dive and learning about these artists. And it, yeah. this experience has brought so much to me that I didn't expect you already. And it's only the first episode. Yeah. So we just recorded this um, this interview with Mallory, and she's awesome. She's an amazing artist. Um, I've been talking to her about doing an interview since like 2019 or something like that. So, um, so this one is is kind of a long time coming. And we were supposed to do this was actually supposed to be the last interview in 2021, and then I got COVID, and so and so now here we are. So. Uh, so I'm excited that this is your first interview, and obviously she's an amazingly talented artist in the convention scene. She's a watercolor artist, but you will learn about all these things if you guys continue listening to the episode. Um, but in the meantime, I'd like to know anything cool you have going on. Do you have any shows coming up? Do you sales for Asteria, your retail shop in Rhode Island, or anything cool? Yeah. What have I been up to that's been cool? Not sure if this is cool, but I've been getting my kit travel ready for an, uh, an event coming up soon that I'll be doing in Nebraska. So this will be my second theater production. Um, I'll be participating in Sweeney Todd in Omaha, Nebraska. So oh. I'm excited to be doing hair and makeup for that. And what else am I doing? I'm currently breaking Wait, down on. a script. Wait, can I ask you about that a little bit? Are you, sure. is this like a, a short amount of time? Like it's a production that goes on for like a week or something like that. And then you every night you have to do the same hair and makeup on the same actors. Yep. So what this is looking like is for for two weeks, we're going to be working on this particular opera. So for the first few days, we're going to be getting settled in. We're going to be doing rehearsals. And then I think three out of three of those days will be doing performance and from there it's it, yeah, it's going to be repetition for a few days. And um, I've only had one theater experience before which was the boston opera and I, I learned a whole lot about working quickly and um it's it's so different than working in the film world and it, i'm really excited about that hmm, cool okay yeah so what else you got going on okay so i'm currently breaking down a script for a film right now and um without sharing too much about it i thought you'd be proud to hear that i actually laughed while reading the script so this is a horror comedy film and um, for the first time ever, I actually caught myself laughing at some of the Whoa. moments in the script. So as soon as I'm allowed to announce anything about this, I'm really excited to share it with you guys because I think you guys would all love it as well. Awesome. I love that. I mean, so this, I wouldn't consider this cool or fun, but, you know, as you know, I own a retail store and something that I haven't been doing before is is 
spending a lot of time and energy and focusing on what I need to do to build this business. And um, I've been spending a lot of time learning about sales growth in retail, merchandising and all of that boring stuff. So mm. hopefully in the near future, this, you know, I can get some real growth with the store as I put more energy and focus into it. Cool. Well, good luck with that. And, you know, at a certain point, talking about things like merchandising, I know that that's like any creative artist, like their eyes just glaze over when um, you start talking in those terms. But I think it is important. And specifically, like a day like today, when we are interviewing someone like Mallory Hart, who has merchandise, and she's got to think about um, the psychology behind selling things to people in a venue like Um, you know, a large venue with a whole bunch of vendors. I think it's, it it is something that we need to talk about at at a certain point. So we should do that. I agree. Absolutely. Um, What have you been up to, Shane? uh, Well, I'm glad you asked. I have some shows coming up. I just got invited into a show with Crucible Gallery. It is an, I'm assuming I could talk about it. It is an Ophelia themed show, um, which is the... Hamlet character? Am I getting that right? Am I getting my Shakespeare Ophelia, right? Ophelia, Hamlet, that's, I, I want to say so. yes, um, yeah. but I think I know as much as you do. Right. So it, it's going to be pretty cool. I'm excited about that. That's in a few months. Um, I'm really starting to think about Monster Palooza, which is coming up in June. And I'm thinking, I've never done this before. I didn't do this at the Son of Monster Palooza in 2019, but I'm thinking about doing some really exclusive things for Monster Palooza that I will like have some build up uh, to put them out on my social media, let them know that they're only going to be available there. And I have a few other like local shows here. I have one in San Francisco going on right now. It's the skate show at Maris Gallery, and that goes till the end of February. And then the show that I have here locally is um, it's by a company called Bodies and Beats. And it's like a it's a body painting show during the opening. And then the actual art show portion of it is nature themed. So I'm pretty excited about that. Yeah, that sounds very that's about it for now. But Well, congratulations on all of that coming up. It sounds okay. like you have a full plate. Um, yeah. And I'm sure, too, after our interview with Mallory, I'm sure your, your mind's been turning about how you can market yourself and use the information that we've discussed and talked about to, totally. to fuel you as you know as you go into all of these events especially with monster palooza i know and i'm trying really like the monster palooza kind of marks like i've done a few local markets here but again like i just moved at the tail end of 2020 to this area in glendale i'm still trying to figure out how to like break into the market a little bit more and so it's been like kind of a weird journey, but Monster Palooza is like the first real big show that I'm going to be doing, uh, returning back after the crazy or during, probably still during the pandemic. Um, so I'm pretty excited about it. And hopefully, um, like we talked about before, hopefully you'll be able to make it out for that too. I so, hope so too. It'd yeah. be awesome. Yeah, but let's uh, let's get on with it then, yeah? This is our interview with the... Amazing watercolor artist, Mallory Hart. She is based in Denver, Colorado, uh, right outside of Denver. And um, we're just totally stoked with having this conversation with her. Hey, we're here for an interview (laughs) with Mallory Hart. Uh, Mallory, welcome to the Drawing From Experience podcast. Thanks for having me, Shane and Stefania. Thank Mally, you so we're much. so excited to have you today on the podcast. I'm looking forward to learning more about you as well. Yeah, I am too. And, uh, you know, like we've crossed paths so many times now. And uh, I we haven't really had, I don't think, like the opportunity to really get to have like a, a serious conversation about, you know, who, who we are and everything. So mm-hmm. that's why I like the podcasting space, because we get to have these conversations. So, yeah. So thanks for making the time. Yeah. I'm excited to do it. So right off the bat here, you are coming off a trip to San Diego for Oddities and Curiosities. How was that entire experience for you? It was good. It was my first show of the year. You know, I had most of November at all November and December off. Um, So it was fun to take some time off and jump back into it. I got back two days ago and yeah, we drove the whole way show went pretty well it was raining and we had the tsunami warning so it was a time to be there oh right (laughs) 
That's always fun. I love a good tsunami warning. We don't get those in Denver. It was... <laughs> <laughs> so you live, you were just telling me that you live right outside of Denver, um, like 15, 20 minutes away in Lakewood. Yeah, um, I live in Lakewood. Yeah. And so uh, you you were born and raised there. You know, I'm curious about, I know a little bit about the Denver art scene, but I don't know a ton. And I'm, I was curious about your opinion about the local art scene there. You know, it's definitely been, it's been picking up in recent years. I don't think it'll never be what LA is or what New York is. Maybe it will be, but it's not that now. We have galleries and they're fine. There's good ones. There's little ones I work with. Uh, but honestly, I travel for shows for mostly now. But we just had the third Meow Wolf open in Denver. And I've been to all three of them. And I do think the Denver one is the best one. Oh, really? By a good amount. Yeah. I've only been to the one in Santa Fe. Yeah, yeah. You, should, you should go to all of them. Um, okay. I, they're all very different. And a lot of my friends have work in the Denver one. And it's I was, huge. It, I was curious so if you, there. being that you have uh, theatrical set painting and um, experience, if you considered working for them. I did. I never applied to be an artist. And that was that process was, I think, four years ago at this point. It was so long ago. And I I wasn't ready at that point. And it's mm. it's really my biggest regret is not doing that. Uh, um, you know, but I didn't. I do think these immersive worlds and these, you know, Instagrammable environments, I think it's the future. You know, I worked in theater and I'm an artist, and I think theater's the past. I think galleries are the future of galleries is not what the past of galleries was, but I think right. things that people can be in and do and experience together and honestly take the picture in, I think it's the future. And I want to do more of it. I want to do some similar stuff, but you got to have a big budget for that. And you got to have other people to work with you. Yeah. Wasn't the original Meow Wolf, wasn't that partially funded by George R.R. R. Martin? Yeah. Yeah. I think it was. God. Um, I, yeah. Can we get him on board? to do some <laughs> other version of that or something I think we else need like I that? think we need like his biggest competitor and I'm not sure who that is but Ooh. I bet we can figure it out. <laughs> yeah. So going back to pictures and Instagramable moments, um one of the first things that stood out to me about your presence as an artist is your social media and how aesthetically pleasing it is. And um, another thing that I've noticed about you and your presence and your setup is your booth setup at shows. And yes. um, your your setup at shows is so visually stunning. It's clean. It's easy to look at. It's neat. Has it taken you a long time to establish that setup for your space? Because it, it looks pretty consistent from show to show from what I've gathered. And um, I'd love to learn a little bit more about your process and how you came about your setup process. Yeah, it's definitely changed. You know, I did my first booth show at the first Denver Comic Con, and I think that was maybe 2012. And I have a picture of it. I look like a little deer in a headlights at a table, and it's you know I've I've come a long way, but I've also had the room to do that. You know there wasn't there wasn't a lot of competition then, and I can't imagine coming into it now, though it's definitely possible. You know, and I I've got a pretty consistent booth set up now. Um, in the past I don't know four months, I did my first 10 by 20 space, moving from a 10 by 10 to doubling the size. And that's been, you know, that's been great. But also, if you look at my booth every show, there's always something different. Every show I'm thinking, I'm like, man, I should put a sign here. I should change this and I should add, you know, something here. Um, and I make a list. And then by the next show, I see if I can add those things. So is Comic-Con one of your first booth experiences? One of your first show experiences? Yeah, I started with the original Denver Comic-Con when it was an independently run show. The booth was $100 and it came with two badges. Um, and I remember wow. when I signed up for it and nobody had heard of it. And I was like, am I just throwing this money away? You know, I was in college. I didn't have a lot of money then. Um, and my, you know, now husband, he like really encouraged me like we should do this. It'd be fun. Um, and then by the time the show came around, that show was great. That show was big. People had a great time. I wasn't selling much, but I, I made money and I made enough money to say that, yeah, I should do this again. And I picked, you know, at that point I was, I was doing the Denver Comic Cons. I would did the local anime convention maybe once or twice. And I would do some, you know, like, I don't want to say craft fairs, but, you know, summer craft kind of market stuff. I would do some of those. Obviously my work isn't quite made for that type of thing, but it went well. Um, and now in the last three years, I've been joining up with the Oddities and Curiosities Expo. 
and it's my people it's the right show it's great and i'm i love it it's everything about it works out for me i've made some good family with all the other vendors but it's just the right crowd they appreciate the dark art and it's not only an art show most of the vendors aren't selling art they're selling skulls and taxidermy you know things in jars you know home and decor kind of stuff Hmm. so it's really great that you're not just competing with other artists but you're you know you're just a part of it and i like that well and i think it's good for like their audience because you get to go to this convention that's not just art or just things in jars or whatever you know you get to go there and see the entire gamut of weird things you know and uh, i actually um i had signed up for two of their events right before the pandemic and they had to cancel all of their events. And since uh, I actually have not re-signed back up for, for their events, but I think eventually I'll, I'll do that show because I hear really good things about it in general. So, yeah, you should definitely, definitely sign up next year. Um, I know she wants to do another San Francisco show. I think that was one you had, but was unable to do it this year for a few reasons, but yeah, I'm doing about 12, 11 or 12 shows of theirs this year. That's Um, amazing. Yeah. I mean, is that once a month? I have none in February. I have one in January and two in March. Um, oh a couple God. I was able, like we're a week apart. You know, like, so I saw Minneapolis and Milwaukee. I'll be able to go out in one trip. I'm going to stay out there. And then same with Portland and Seattle. Wait, so do you, you have a, you have a van, right? I do. At the end of 2019, I bought a minivan. Um, and I took all the seats out of it. So it's basically just got a passenger seat, a driver's seat and a bunch of space in the back. I drive it around the country. Oh, it works out. I love that so much. Yeah. That's that is like that's kind of like my ideal vision of things. Like yeah, I, I you know, would it really was like a, to do that. It was a big purchase, you know, and obviously I think everyone's ideal in this kind of market is getting the sprinter van and all that. But the minivan, the minivan's great. It's low to the ground, it drives great. You can park in parking garages, it has a lot of room, and you can pull out the seats out. Which what did you get? What's the I year got, and what's the model? Yeah, I got a 2011 Dodge Grand Caravan. Cool. Okay. Noted. I'm writing that yeah. down. Yeah. I mean, I think that's great. Like, just the fact that that is such a huge part of your art business. Um, and there's plenty of artists that don't do any conventions at all. And Stefania, so you, um, you've recently, I, you do some conventions, around you right I just started participating in conventions um so I recently did comic-con in Providence and that was my first major event and uh Mallory that was actually a question I had for you but I was curious to know if when you were just starting out with getting your work into the market and and learning how to sell your work were you working more with local events or um smaller events in your area such as like fundraisers or anything local in that regard? Yeah, I definitely started out just doing local shows. I did look out that Denver Comic Con got to be a pretty big show comparatively. And I think, I don't know, a few years in, my first out-of-state show was Salt Lake's Fan X. And it went well. I ended up going back out there. I did that show a few more times. And then once the oddity shows picked up, then I really started traveling for them. I might have done a couple other out-of-state Comic Cons, but the Comic-Con audience, while they're great, most of them are there for fan art. They're there for superheroes and they're there to spend money on autographs. Yeah. This is why I haven't done and the, Comic-Con. The booths are so expensive and they're three days long. And honestly, that's why I love the oddity shows is they're one day long. Everybody yeah. there is wearing black. They're here to buy skulls and dark <laughs> things. And... I love that. Um, so what are your tips for people? I, you know, I've done a lot of episodes in the past about, uh, about conventions and um, being there, like you were saying, at like every new event that you have, you're always like, ah, oh, maybe I should put like a new sign over here. W- w- the thing that I always realize is the psychology behind how it's set up, how that gets people to move around in your booth. You almost have to like play this game where you're like, if I put this one thing here, it'll probably prevent people from standing in this spot, which means they'll move around to this side, which is where my prints are. And they'll actually fucking look at them then. You know what I mean? So you have to like kind of play these games. So like what kind of setup advice do you have for people who've never done it? Who's who it seems like really 
daunting to even have to set up like like Stefania was saying your booth setup is like amazing it looks really good it's really concise it's really um clean looking and so when people look at that they're probably like oh my god this person's been doing this for so long they're like a total veteran in the space so yeah so what kind of advice do you have for somebody just starting out so if you're just starting out i imagine you're looking at like an artist alley table and my biggest advice for that is to have something behind you you know when you're walking down these like long lines of tables and artist alley the ones that stand out are the ones with a wall behind them a lot of people go with the you know what i like to call is the wall of prints and i i don't i don't love the wall of prints and i think it's kind of busy and hard to look at and tacky i think it if you make fan art you have a wall of prints and that's that but even just getting a pop-up banner you know i if I had to move back to that setup, I use a photo backdrop stand with a bar across and I have like a six by eight foot banner of a skull on it with my website. And even just having that behind you, it brings it brings attention to your table. And I'd also get something as simple as a tablecloth. If you're in an artist alley and they give you, you know, yellow table skirting and you're in a big line of yellow table skirtings, get the black tablecloth. It, wow. it automatically is going to draw your eye to it and get people there. You know, and you got to have I guess the other thing I've learned is people like to pick things up and touch them. A lot of artists, you know, they have a portfolio book of all their prints in it and you'll say, I want that one. And then you go in the back and you grab the print and you put it in a bag and sign it and give it to them. I think that people would much rather pick up the print pre-packaged with a backboard in it, hold it in their hand and they know, they know what product they're getting. They don't have to talk to you. They can say, yes, this is it. I like it. I like how it feels. And then they can buy that. And once I started doing that, I think that helped a lot selling prints as well. I've also noticed that you utilize ways to market yourself and draw people to your social media or to um, create more buzz around some of the products that you use at your booth. I think I noticed that you were using pin giveaways or a giveaway of some sort for visitors at your booth. And I also um, learned that you may have used QR codes in the past to draw people to your social media. And I was wondering if some of these methods have proven to work for you and maybe which methods may not have worked. Well, first off, I don't think people knew what a QR code was until the pandemic. I think they knew, but I don't think anybody knew how to use or used a QR code. So I stopped. I did that for a few shows and I stopped. But I do wonder if since we've all had to use QR codes at restaurants, if maybe maybe we'll all use QR codes again. Um, I do the pin giveaway. I haven't done it since the pandemic. But I would, you know, I have a button maker, makes little inch and a half buttons. And I sell packs too at times, but I would just make a bunch of random ones and I would give someone a free pin if they can show me that they're following me on Instagram. And that worked. Occasionally, if it was really busy, it would get hard because you'd inevitably have a group of six girls trying to pitch which pins they want and they're not buying anything. But overall, I do think it got, I would be gaining probably 100 followers a show at that point. And that was really helpful. Um, they don't all stay, but I haven't done it since the pandemic just because I haven't felt like I've needed it as much. And it's just one more thing to touch and have people there, but maybe I'll bring it back. Speaking of the pandemic too, I've also noticed that you found ways to somewhat navigate through the situation that we're in as an artist. And I discovered some of the face masks that you were creating. They're beautiful. So there, I saw one of a skull and I think it was a death's head moth. And I was wondering if you found that to be an effective way to navigate through what we're going through as artists and how else you may have been um, working through this as a professional and trying to continue to grow your business. Yeah, the face masks were really fun. I had originally, I think I did 100 of each of the designs. Maybe I did 50 of each. I sold them out. I sold my last ones at the oh. Dallas Oddity Show, which was in March of 21. I didn't make more. Because I was hoping that we would never need face masks again. Yeah. And, you know, mm. Maybe I should have made them. We wouldn't need them anymore. It's all my fault. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you know, I spent the time not on the road during 2020. I was home trying to make art and figuring out what's next. You know, my online sales were up a little bit then. So that was nice. But yeah, I just just trying to make new work and take advantage of the downtime was what I did, but I'm glad to be back. I'm glad the shows are happening again. And I hope we can keep it this way. During the normal, the normal times, are, are your online sales the majority of your business or is it in the convention world? Definitely not. The online sales are a small fraction of what I do. Uh, and I yeah. wish I could change it, but the internet's a big ocean of 
a lot of competition but yeah most of the money that i make from my art is at the shows um in-person sales i think it's um i mean this is just the theory but i think it's your heart-shaped glasses i think that's what sells people (laughs) (laughs) i sell i have a heart-shaped glasses pin that i sell oh nice yeah because i had a cat i painted a cat wearing heart-shaped glasses and i made a Ah. pin of the glasses the cat was wearing but creative conquest Joey Edwards said, All the pumpkins I sold and shipped through pirate shipping arrived safe and sound. Seems like this opened up some additional commission work for down the road and I sold another. Congrats, Joey, on the sales. I'm happy your items shipped safely and also in turn resulted in another sale. Richard Ingersoll said, Finished a book cover I'm pretty excited about. Did the layout of the spine and back cover a couple days ago and I think it'll be in print soon. He's also making progress on commissions that have been sitting around for an embarrassing amount of time. Thankful for patient clients. Congratulations with both the book cover and the commissions, Richard. Looking forward to seeing your work in the future in the group, and also be sure to share some photos of the book cover when you're able to. Paul E. Schultz said, I started drawing again after a three-month-long creative slump. That's a pretty big victory from here. Paul, I completely agree with you. That's a huge victory in my book. Keep doing what you're doing, and please be sure to share your work with us in the group. Thank you guys so much for sharing your creative conquests with us. If you would like to share your creative conquests, you can join us on our Facebook page at the Drawing From Experience Creative Community. Well, let's... I would love to uh, backtrack a little bit to the early years of Mallory Hart making artwork here. I'm assuming, this is just an assumption, but I'm assuming you were the art kid, like doodling in class. Was that you? Yeah, yeah, I definitely was. You know, my mom likes to tell me that, you know, I was in preschool, so I don't know, four years old, that, you know, she'd come to pick me up and the class would be watching a movie or something and I did not care about movies and I would be across the room drawing. And I've, you know, I've been drawing my whole life. I drew a lot of cats as a kid. I drew, would draw a cat. And then the corner would be the sun also shaped like a cat. Um, Yeah. And then I think I just always knew I would be an artist. I did go um, into theater immediately kind of after college as a part-time job. And I still do a little bit in theater, though my goal this year is to become a full-time artist and no longer work there. Oh, okay. Um, I would imagine the the theater world was difficult um, during the pandemic. And are you you've returned back to that now? Are there there's theatrical performances again? Yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm primarily in the theater world. I'm a scenic artist, so I paint and make theater sets. You know, not just painting, but you know, sculpting and texturizing and carving foam and that kind of things. So I do that for the Denver Center Performing Arts, which is a big theater complex here. Um, and then I'll also work as an overhire, which is just kind of a fancy word for part-time with no guaranteed amount of hours um, for like events, running lights and working backstage and that kind of a thing. Gotcha. So th- this is your aim this year to just say goodbye to that world and just to do art full-time. Yeah, I would still, I love scenic painting and I love working on big projects. You know, it kind of goes into like what Meow Wolf's doing. I think that things could be created so much larger with more people being involved so I don't want to give that up entirely but I would like to be able to take charge more when I'm doing those things and only pick and choose the projects that interest me in that sense yeah I mean I feel you for sure so did you um you went to school for illustration you went to the Rocky Mountain College of Art yeah I went to the Rocky Mountain College of Art and Design um I got my degree in 2013 in illustration Did you go to school immediately after high school or did you take some time before getting your degree in illustration? Nope. I went right into it. I graduated high school in 2010 and went right into college at RIMCAD. How was your art school experience overall? You know, I, it was great for me, but I'm a big sayer that, you know, art school, you're going to get out of it, what you put into it. A lot of people say they have a horrible time there and I, I think a lot of people expect it all to come to them, but it's hard. It's hard work and you have to be willing to dedicate a lot of time and extra energy that I don't think you would have to do in other degrees. Though I could be wrong. And I also think the art world is like that too. It's not just going to come to you. It's not going to fall in your lap. You have oh to put my a lot gosh, of work into I know, it. right? Go I've made Molly. great connections, sorry, with, you know, friends that I made that I'm still friends with and, you know, professors that I had that are still people that I talk to, you know, very frequently and are involved in the local art community. And even, 
you know, others that I went to school with that are vendors now that, you know, do all the shows with me. So it's been great for connections. And I wonder if I didn't go to school, I don't, I don't think I would be in as good a place as I am now. I think that's what I hear a lot of people say when they look back on their experience with school is they, it's been more so about the connections they make or um, some of the opportunities that they received through the school and how they pursue that later on. And continued education has become so important too. Um, I was wondering, have you, do you feel as though you've built a lot of your skill set in school or do you feel as though a lot of it has grown later on as you've developed more of your style? I think both. I think I learned a lot of basics in school. I think I learned a lot of concepts that I might have figured out eventually, but I wasn't necessarily thinking about then that school kind of forced me to figure out. But I'm always still learning, you know, and then when I'm doing set painting in theater, every set is an entirely different problem and challenge. And every set you're learning new techniques and learning new things. And I love to take those ideas and those techniques and kind of bring them into smaller stuff to put into my own work. Where did you where did you develop this style for your work? Because your work is very much yours. When when I see a piece of your artwork, I can tell that it is a Mallory Hart original you know so um this you know you work primarily in watercolor and you have you just have this really cool style to it so is that was that a conscious decision or was that something that just sort of like uh, always kind of was there and then you just sort of developed it over the years man that's a hard question i think i've always just painted the things that i want to paint and the things Cats. that i enjoy painting you know i yeah cats are great who doesn't love cats i love cats but you know i've kind of started painting skulls because I, you know, who doesn't love a skull? They're kind of timeless. But then I kept painting the skulls because I love the texture of them. I think there's so much to them and I really enjoy that. So I've kept doing that. But then, you know, you paint one thing one day and you do something to it and you say, yeah, I think that's really cool. And then maybe you do that again, or maybe you paint something you don't like it and you kind of throw that to the side. So I don't think it was necessarily a conscious decision, but now, you know, I have, you know, a small fan base that likes my work. And if I want to paint something that's not in that I, you know, I can, but I also have to paint the things I know are going to sell and the things I know right. are going to so do well. Is that debilitating to you at all to be it, like part of your own prison that you've designed and created for yourself? And I mean, this is like a pressure that I hear from a lot of artists that they're like, I, you know, find your style, find your thing that you do. But then a lot of artists then once that's expected of you from your own fan base that you've built, you know, they're like, I don't want to do that anymore, you know, and then people get upset, you know, so how, do, how yeah. do you feel about that personally? Well, I, I love painting skulls and cats and dark things and dark birds. And I think I, I can always continue to do those and I'll be happy. But, you know, a few months ago, I painted a tiger and I loved this tiger. I was so proud of this tiger. I think it's great. That thing did not do well on Instagram. It did horrible. Oh. <laughs> but, you know, if I show, you know, my family and people that I know that aren't necessarily into dark art, they think it's great. They love it. But Apparently I can't paint tigers, so I do think I'm going to do a tiger with three eyes and they'll... I know well, which tiger you're talking about. Yeah. I love that tiger. Hold on, wait. I want to take <laughs> that a look at fantastic. it. That tiger is fantastic. But the, you know, the thing is, though, too, is, is, that, are, is that decision mainly based on your engagement from Instagram? Because if that's the case, we know that Instagram is swashing mm -hmm. posts, you know, left yeah. and right. So it's like only a very small amount of your people are seeing it. And even if those people are seeing it because it's slightly different, maybe they're not engaging with it for the, just for that simple reason. And then, mm -hmm. so that means the rest of the people are not seeing it because it's not getting enough engagement, you know? So yeah, I think that, yeah, I, I understand what you're saying there and that's definitely a thing, but I also made prints of this tiger and I think I've uh, maybe sold like two. <laughs> is it this tiger right here? Yes, it is that I love tiger. This tiger. <laughs> yeah. It's a great tiger. So oh, Mallory, I can definitely majestic. tell you're an animal lover, not I only from your them. posts, but I, mostly I would just like, cats. I would love to say too, when I was reading your bio on your website, how you wrote that you have two cats. Mm -hmm. um, I love that. I, you're definitely a, you know, a, a mom to your cats. Kitty and mom. I can see too, that inspires your, your work and your, what drives you to create. Yeah. I'm just a big cat person. I think they're the best. And I love them a lot. We also have a dog and a lizard and they're great as well. I am a cat person as well. Cats are my spirit animals. I have like three sets of cat ears around here. I should have worn them today. I wish I did, but I didn't. We should have all worn cat ears. And oh my God. Um, and I've also got a cat on my hoodie. 
there <laughs> it's tough to tell, but there are hidden cats in here. Oh, I see him. These are very cute. I love cats. I love it. Perfect. Perfect, Shane. But there's also, there's a tiger right over here. Oh, good. So, I, I also love to, uh, to paint cats as well. And they're, uh, my, my mom has currently, um, I don't live with my mom. She, she lives in Pennsylvania, but she has 12 indoor cats. And that's oh my pretty gosh. much how I grew up was always that's... like at least 10 indoor cats at a time. So that's yeah. a lot of cats. I, I only have two cats. I would definitely have more cats, except I travel so much and it's so hard to find someone to watch my animals right now as is that yeah. I can't imagine, you know, burdening them with more cats. <laughs> yeah. But. Uh, Stefani, do you have any, do you have any animals? I have two cats. You do? Perfect. Babies. Yep. I, I don't even view them as pets. I view them as my children. So yeah. it, like everything about Mallory and her work and the fact that she makes it a point that she has cats like resonates with me. Yeah. You know, I will say that when I'm at my shows, you know, and people see that I have cats, and, you know, I'm busy, right? It's a busy show. And people always insist on getting out their phone <laughs> and showing me pictures of all of their cats. And like, this is fine. I love your cats. I'd love to see your cats, but this is not the time or the place <laughs> to show me your cats and they'll take time they'll be like oh i can't find the photo and they'll, they'll just be standing there for you know minutes and what seems like hours until they find the right photo maybe it's cat like good job <laughs> maybe that's the maybe that's the next sign you should have for the next convention <laughs> you know and actually i mean maybe you could you could tie that into your next giveaway if you want um where i don't know maybe they have to send you send it to you instead like virtually instead I, of having to show you at the shows you know it reminds me i did a giveaway probably a few years ago now because i do a lot of pet portraits and i did a pet portrait giveaway on instagram but the way i framed it was everybody has to message me their pets now and i'd got mm. hundreds and hundreds of messages of pets oh but God. i wanted them so i could just keep them for reference photos if anyone had any particularly cool pets oh that's clever yeah um and then you know i the person who won ended up being a bunny and it was random oh but there was some there was some interesting animals people sent me for that one. Yeah, and I might do that again someday. That's cool. Um, you know, one one thing that I when I look at artists like you doing these kinds of shows and everything, I always pay attention to the kind of merchandise that you're actually selling. And this is something that I don't know how often people have this kind of conversation where they're talking about the, the merchandise, the actual goods that you're selling as a retail shop essentially right so i personally have like a hard time deciding what my next like item is gonna be and it's i don't know you seem a little more effortless in that way i'm sure it isn't effortless um but i am curious like how you make your decisions on what you think is going to be popular and what is popular and which things have kind of not panned out as well yeah well obviously i try and often i'm wrong but I think a lot of the merchandise choices I make too are based on how many of those can I reasonably take to a show. So prints are easy. You know, I have a I have two print bins for my different sizes and it's how many I can fit in there. If I'm adding more designs, I have to phase out old designs or bring less of stuff, you know, and adding prints is easy if I add them in the correct sizes that I'm already selling. You know, adding in more sizes is difficult and then there comes pricing issues and right. how I'm going to offer that. And then I do enamel pins and patches. And again, those are kind of, they have to stay in the same size range in the same realm as the other pins because of how I offer my pricing. Um, and I've been offering these like desk mat play mats, which have been popular. And those work out really well because they pack really easy. You know, they're, they're flat. They don't take up a lot of space. And I have one area on my table where I can, I currently only display two designs. I just had a third made that I'm really excited about but in my brain, I already have to figure out how I'm going to display three of those now instead of two, mm. you know, and then I'm sure we're all familiar with print on demand apparel websites. So I offer those and I offer a lot more things online that I offer in my shows, but I've been bringing three t-shirts to my shows. And I know that each t-shirt takes up, you know, one box of this size. And I, if I'm going to add more, I'd have to figure out how to repack my van at this point. Right. Um. So what, what do you think is the best, what is the best seller out of all of those different things that you sell? 
my prints my prints definitely do the best for me um patches and pins have been doing a lot better since i expanded my booth size and i've given them their own table now that i have you know patches and pins in the back and i have stickers in the front and those work out really well and that's it's given them more space to breathe and people can see them more and buy more of them yeah and then i also you know and i also sell originals at shows and i put framed ones on the walls behind me i don't sell framed ones that frequently i sell my unframed ones a lot more probably because they're cheaper unframed originals yeah oh wow Interesting. yeah so they're on paper i package them on mat board and in plastic and they look really nice and i suppose you could display them like that if you want but i hope people are framing them yeah yeah sorry i've also started to keep in mind that the originals that i hang behind me you know if i bring this one original and it's large then that sells the prints right people like the image of it but then they're buying the cheaper print instead so that's helped out a lot. Are you producing your own prints yourself in your studio right now? No, I outsource all mine um, to a company called Cat Print, and I think they do great Cat work, Prince? and I love them. And they give money to cats. It's perfect. Are you serious? <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Oh, that's great. I never heard of them before. That's really great. It's yeah. an online service? Yeah, they're based out of New York. They have a lot of different you know paper options etc i've really figured out like which paper works best for me and it kind of the one i use is their i think it's called felt but it kind of mimics a watercolor paper texture and i really love it it's got like that dull matte finish but it's got a nice texture to it cool so let me ask you being that you you spend so much of your time on the road and doing these shows and everything how do you split your time in between making the art making the products and things and the, and the actual, like the business portion of your business, you know, are you painting every day? Is it like every week you're trying to make one piece or something like that? Yeah, it definitely depends on what I'm doing. Um, and, you know, trying to become a full-time artist this year, that's what I'm hoping to have a better grasp on, but I'm definitely painting more when shows are not happening. So I have no shows in February, so I'll be painting more, but really you know if i'm leaving for a show the day before i have to pack the van and the few days before that i'm you know packaging prints and just getting everything ready and then when i get home i have to unpack my van and you know enter stuff into spreadsheets and that kind of thing and pay taxes so i paint when i can and i think we all know that you know being a full-time artist being an artist you know you're not painting 100 percent of that time you're painting like 50 percent of the time you know and I, I try to paint when i'm feeling right when i'm feeling when I feel like painting, you know, I know I'll do the best work then, which is generally in the evenings and the mornings, I might be doing more of business type work and errands, that kind of thing. Hmm. What's your thought process usually when you're actually painting and making the work? Oh man. Um, <laughs> I don't know how to answer that, Shane. <laughs> <laughs> I really put you on when, the spot here. When you sit down to create Mallory, do we, do you have a preconceived thought of what it is that you want to create or do you allow yourself to sit down and allow those thoughts and ideas to flow as you're creating yeah I definitely have sketches in my sketchbook of what I'm gonna do but sometimes if I'm painting something that's really similar to something I just painted I'll go right into the paper I I'll do my final drawing on the paper I know a lot of artists like to do it on you know on another sheet and then transfer it with transfer paper and all that and I I don't do that so there is some deciding on the spot but the other thing I'll do is especially if it's a larger piece is I'll photograph it when it's almost done and then I'll go into my iPad and test out some ideas to see if it works and then go back to the full piece so is this I mean is this an intuitive process when you're actually coming up with those designs like do you just kind of follow it or is it more just like the is it just the the visual stimulation of it and the you know if it looks cool you know versus you know the feeling i i definitely go for how it looks i like i like it to be a good balanced composition and that's definitely where i prioritize what i want do you talk to your art not usually <laughs> but i'm not saying no are you like larry <laughs> give me a more of a grimace here like i don't know <laughs> <laughs> only if larry's not grimacing properly yeah i think shane hit the nail on the head when he said that your work is unique to you and you have your own style and aesthetic uh, nailed to, to the point where we recognize that it's yours. And I remember at the Dark Art Society show, your work, I it was a 
it was two skulls. It was red um, with the drips. And it's it was one of the first things that stood out to me on that wall. It was so striking and vibrant and so unique. And it's you have your own signature um, style to your work. Has it taken you a long time to establish that aesthetic in your work? Or have you had that since the get-go when you first started creating? You know, I don't even know if I'm the right person to answer that. I also, I love that you guys think I have a unique style because I think we all struggle with not thinking our artwork is unique and stylized enough. But I, you know, I think I, I figured out that I like the drips and everything, maybe on a piece I did about eight years ago. And I've kind of kept going with that, but that's not, I don't do it in every piece, right? So it's not everything. Did you go to the Dark Art Society show in person though? I did. On a total tangent. I didn't know you were there. That's I awesome. Was there. I that's was there awesome. in the flesh. Uh, that's How far is that from you? It was only a, cu- a couple of hours. I think it was actually just under two hours away. Oh, so it was amazing. pretty close to me. And yep, Shane, I saw your work and I saw cool. Ma- Mallory's, I will say one Mallory's piece because it's so the vibrance in it against the white on the wall and because everyone's work is so dark in there her work really stood out to me yeah that um, red. and it was it was very striking and visually appealing yeah thank you that's that's really nice to hear thank you so much stefania of course i hope to that's make it so out cool. to his space in maine sometime i love maine um, i grew up going out there with my family because my dad's from the east coast so we would we would do a family vacation every other year in maine oh, we stopped cool. for which pandemic. part of maine on the coast, I spaced the name of the most <laughs> yeah. recent place we've been staying in, but I will figure it out for you real quick. Yeah, I, I've been to, I, I want to say it's Bar Harbor. Yes, um, I've been to Bar Harbor. Oh, really? Near, no I, way. We always drive to Bar Harbor when we're there. Oh, that's so cool. We always stay as a family at this place. It's like a family camp place. There's different like cabins and stuff, but like they make you dinner and breakfast. And the camp is called Hiram Blake. And it is in a town, it's near Brooksville, Maine, is where they're having it. The town I know that it's in is much smaller. And Yeah. Well, I know Maine is like, it's it's a pretty large state too. I remember, so I used to drive there from Pennsylvania and it was like an eight hour drive or something like that. And then from Pennsylvania to Maine to like entering Maine, it was like four hours or something but then Mm -hmm. it was another four hours just Mm -hmm. to get to the place that we want to be (laughs) in Maine which is pretty crazy but um, I'm actually I'm teaching a painting workshop at uh, Skull and Snake Tattoo I was invited there by Dan within the next few months so I will be over there so I'm yeah. excited sure to be there. Yeah, it's going to be pretty cool. Yeah. I'm, I'm hoping maybe in the next couple of years we'll go back out there, but the pandemic threw everything off. Who knows? It did? No, I'm just joking. It did. <laughs> did you know that the this pandemic happened, Shane? I, I, don't, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> well, do you have any projects or anything coming up? Um, I know you have obviously a lot of shows. Um, are you in any other gallery shows coming up? Um, are you working on anything really big? that maybe you can give us a little bit of uh, info on or anything you want to promote today? Yeah, not a ton. I just finished a piece for a Chinese New Year's show at a local gallery called Valkyrie, and they do some really cool stuff. So all that I believe will open, I think at the very beginning of February. But I just finished up that piece and it's a three-eyed tiger this time. Um, <laughs> and then I Do you think will... this, this, this tiger is going to do better? I think so. Hang on, I'll show you. Awesome. Oh, I love it. Yeah. Yeah, it's there got the is. three eyes. There's people, Larry. People seem to like that. <laughs> There's Larry the Tiger. So yeah, I've got that coming up for shows. Um, I was invited to the Wow X Wow show, and I've been trying to kind of get with them for a little while. So I feel like a tiny success there. Cool. And then I'll be doing the Oddities and Curiosities Expo in Albuquerque and Dallas in March. So those are my next traveling shows that I'm preparing wow. for. And I'll also be at Monster Palooza this summer. So that's uh oh yeah lovely i will be there i'll, I'll be there stefani is trying to uh trying make to the trip there. as well ah oh, i can't wait yeah yeah i can't either there's good people there i moved up from a table to a 10 by 10 this year in hopes that eventually i can get a corner cool that's a that's enough to look forward to yeah <laughs> not so much i don't have much going on those are some really <laughs> exciting events congratulations yeah i want to i want to be doing some bigger gallery shows i've been trying to get in with 
Copro and Dark Art Emporium in the LA area with little to no luck so far. So oh, no. can, you know, wish me luck there. Yeah. Say nice things about me on my behalf. <laughs> I will. I'd be happy to do that. Yeah. Um, well, um, hopefully this, goals for this, this podcast, um, we can promote it. We'll put it out there and more people will see it and hopefully more people will get to know you and hear your story and everything. So yeah, well, thank you. Thank you so much for, yeah. for joining us. How do people find you online? Yeah, I think the best place is to start is my Instagram, which is at Mallory Heart Art. And my website is MalloryHeartArt.com. I have a Patreon that I imagine is also Mallory Heart Art, but there's a link on Instagram and my website to that. And I have a cool. Facebook page as well, Mallory Heart Art. All right, we'll put all of those things in the show notes for this Thank episode. You. If you guys enjoyed this episode, you can stream and download on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, or Spotify. On Spotify, we're trying to get reviews and ratings on there. So if you guys can go right now and rate and review us on there, we would really appreciate it. And we are going to be picking some to potentially read on this podcast. Um, you can also find us on our website, drawingfromexperience.com, or join the Drawing From Experience creative community on Facebook. And you can also find us on Instagram at DFE Podcast or our Patreon at patreon.com slash drawing from experience. Um, you can find me on shaneisakowski.com or my Patreon, uh, patreon.com slash shaneisakowski and my Instagram or Facebook at Shane Isaacowski Artist. Uh, Stefania, where do we find you online? You can find me at stefaniamaderas.com. On Instagram, you can find me at stefaniamaderas underscore. And on Patreon, you can find me at patreon.com slash stefaniamaderas. Lovely. Mallory, thank you again so much for taking the time to chat with us. Finally, this is a long time coming. We've been talking about this for a while. I think it was at, wasn't I trying to interview you at designer con or something like that yeah that was that was a while back i think i realized like during these shows maybe it's not a good idea to also pile on <laughs> interviews because you were I don't like know how you do any of this oh my god yeah so um so i'm glad we we got to do it in this space and we all yeah. get to uh be in our own spaces and, and chat so yeah it's great mallory Thank it was you. so nice meeting you today and getting to know you a little bit more yeah hopefully we'll all be showing art at the same places sometime soon yeah sounds good thank you thank you guys bye-bye